This evening, I would like to say a few things about the lost wax or investment method of casting metal. Briefly, this is where a model in wax is melted away before metal fills the mold. The wax model can originally be made by an artist or taken from an original, even an original in bronze. The oldest known example of this technique is a 6,000-year-old amulet from Pakistan. The technique was widespread in Europe until the 18th century. Most metals are suitable, but here we will consider bronze in particular. Bronze is an alloy composed of about 90% copper and 10% tin, with a variable amount of lead depending on how complicated the mold is. Many Renaissance so-called bronzes are in fact brass, being an alloy of copper and zinc. Many bronze statues or parts of statues in antiquity were cast using the lost wax process. For example, it was used often in the classical world to make small objects and later on it was even used to make parts of large statues that were then put together. The person who was first credited of using the lost wax method of casting is Theodorus of Samos, dating to the 6th century BC. He is also often co-credited with the invention of smelting ore and according to Pausanias, the art of casting. Because it has a lower melting point than pure copper, bronze will stay liquid longer when filling a mold. Bronze also has superior tensile strength. The island of Cyprus is an ancient source for copper. The name of the island may have roots in the Sumerian word for copper, zubar, or for bronze, kubar. We know that the name of Cyprus likely derived from the classical Latin Aeus Cyprium, which translates as the metal of Cyprus. Later, this was shortened to cuprum. Tin, the other alloy used in bronze, was much scarcer than copper. In the classical world, it was imported from as far away as Cornwall, although they were likely major sources in Anatolia as well. The earliest large-scale Greek bronze statues had very simple forms dictated by their technique of manufacture, which is today often described as hammer-driven. Parts of the statue are made separately of hammered sheets of metal and attached to one another with rivets. These metal sheets could be embellished by hammering the bronze over wooden forms in order to produce reliefs or by incising designs. Of course, these statues may have been composite, made of hammered sheets of metal attached to wood, and then painted to disguise the true origins. By the late Archaic period, about 500 to 480 BC, lost wax casting became the major technique for producing bronze statuary. In other words, larger bronze articles. The lost wax casting of bronze objects can be divided into solid law uh, lost wax casting for small things and hollow lost wax castings for larger things. The direct method is the earliest and simplest process. It calls for a model fashioned in solid wax which is surrounded by a clay or plaster mold. This is then heated in order to remove the wax and harden the clay or plaster. After this bronze is added, the mold is destroyed when the metal object is removed from it. If the casting failed, the wax model, 
and the sculptor's entire work was lost. Even if the casting was successful, only one bronze could be produced from the sculptor's model. There was great incentive to develop a technique that did not endanger the original model. There was incentive to develop a technique that was capable of producing a number of examples from one original. This was not quite mass production, but it was definitely more organized production. The indirect method of lost wax casting makes a wax form from another object and preserves the original mold. There are some problems, however. A sculptor may model wax into any conceivable shape using the direct casting method. With indirect casting, the difficulty lies in removing the original model from the mold without destroying either. An undercut is any indentation or protrusion in a shape that will present, prevent its withdrawal from a one-piece mold. Undercuts can still be molded, but require a side action or a side pull, in other words, another part of the mold. If the size of the undercut is small enough and the material is flexible enough, a side action is not always required. Here I can present an example. This is a plaster mold. This is the object that I cast. And as can be seen, it fits into the plaster mold. Now, of course, I use this for taking a mold of an original object, and here is the original object. I coated this original bronze with soap. I put it in plaster. I could then easily remove the original object, and then after I removed the object, I could put the two halves of the mold together and pour wax into the mold, and this wax would be the intermediate step. There was no need, in other words, for an original made of wax. I can describe briefly the indirect process. But the most important thing about the indirect process is mold making. Here's an example of a flexible mold made for an object that looks simple, but that in fact had undercuts that prevented the object from being removed from the mold. The indirect method was not only a technological advance, it, it was an incredible advance on the number of objects that can be created and no doubt would have led to the wide dissemination of an artist's work. The process, the indirect process, was known to the ancient Greeks, but because of trade secrets, there was no written description that survives. This is not uncommon because almost certainly artists kept secret like, a secret like this to themselves. There was some indirect casting that was practiced in the Middle Ages, but in general, the tradition we have today was largely reinvented in Italy no later than the last quarter of the 15th century. An artist would create an original. Using the indirect method, you could even take a mold from an original that was made by another artist, say, that ended up to you in bronze. The mold maker would obtain this original object and could make any number of copies. In modern terms, 
the indirect method would make it possible for a copyright infringer to benefit from someone else's work. The key is mold making. A mold is made of the original model or sculpture. Most molds are made of at least two pieces and the mold can produce any number of intermodels. Once the mold is finished, molten wax is poured into it. Hollow lost wax is used for large statues. Large scale sculptures were often cast in several pieces. Pieces such as the head, torso, arms, and legs. Each part was hollow. This is because metal is expensive and heavy and these parts could be attached together to form a complete statue. In the case of the mold, the wax would be swished around until an even coating, usually about one eighth of an inch or three millimeters thick, covers the inner surface of the mold. This is repeated until the desired thickness is reached. Another method is to fill the entire mold with molten wax and let it cool until a desired thickness has set on the surface of the mold. After this, the rest of the wax is poured out again and the mold is turned upside down. The wax layer is left to cool and harden. With this method, it is more difficult to control the overall thickness of the wax layer. To return to our example, when making a wax intermold using this, it is so thin there is no need to make it hollow. You can see it's thin. With something like this, it's a very thick piece and this was made using a hollow mold. I will discuss this piece a bit later. After making the hollow mold, it's important to remove the wax. The hollow wax copy of the original model is removed from the mold. The mold maker may reuse the mold to make multiple copies of the intermodel. This process is limited only by the durability of the mold. Chasing is where each hollow wa wax copy is chased with a heated metal tool which is used to rub out the marks which show the parting line or flashing where the pieces of the mold came together. As an example, a wax mold that would come from here would have this area that would need treatment in order to even it out. It's important to remember that with a wax mold, the metal will follow the wax so any imperfection in the wax mold should be treated early rather than late. Sprewing is where the wax copy is sprued with a tree-like structure of wax that will eventually provide paths for the molten casting material to flow and for air to escape. The carefully planned sprewing usually begins at the top with a wax cup. Here we see the wax cup. We see the sprues that were used to fill the metal into the sculpture and we see this air channel that would have easily expelled the air from the metal statue. However, we see despite the fact that there was a sprue at the join of the ear to the body, because the ear is a small projecting area of the statue, this part did not fill completely. Here is another example. In fact, it's the example from this mold. And because it was thin, there was no problem in the metal filling out this entire piece. As you can see, the pro projecting areas like legs, would have to be sprued so that the metal would flow easily between these. There were 
several other places where channels were made to expel air, but these have not survived. After sprueing, a the sprued wax copy would be dipped into a slurry of silica and then into a sand-like stucco or dry crystalline silica of a controlled grain size. The slurry and grit combination is called the ceramic shell mold material, although it is not literally made of ceramic. This shell is allowed to dry and the process is repeated until a half inch of coating covers the entire piece. The bigger the piece, the thicker the shell needs to be. Only the inside of the cup at the top is not coated, and the cup's flat top serves as the base upon which the piece stands during this process. Briefly, a piece should be able to stand on the cup, like this, during the process. A burnout is where the ceramic shell-coated piece is placed cup down into a kiln. The heat hardens the silica coatings in a shell and the wax melts and runs out. The original artwork and the feeder and the vent tubes are now negative space formerly occupied by the wax. Testing is when the ceramic shell is allowed to cool and then is tested with water to see if the water will flow freely through the feeder and vent tubes. Cracks or leaks can be patched at this time. Pouring is where the shell is heated to remove all moisture and then placed cup upwards into a tub filled with sand. Bronze melts between 850 and 1000 degrees Celsius. Metal is then poured into a hot shell. It is important that the shell is hot and dry, otherwise it can explode when the metal is poured into it. As can be seen here, casting is far from a simple process and no doubt would have required an extensive period of apprenticeship before someone was capable of doing something like a master. Release is when the shell is hammered or sandblasted away. The channels are cut off and reused. Metal chasing is an important element. Just as the wax copies were chased, the casting is worked until the signs of the casting process are removed. Voids left by air bubbles are filled. This step can be a lot of work. We see here that not only do we need to cut off the channels, but there are cracks in the mold that formed. This flash would have to be removed. This area that did not fill properly would have to be patched. And of course, for a proper bronze piece, it is important to polish the surface. This would have taken someone using, say, a polishing stone a very long period of time. And this step is often severely underestimated by people who don't understand the artistry involved in bronze casting. Finally, it's possible to coat the surface with an oxide for color. It's also possible to use a time-honored technique of using sawdust and urine and allowing the surface to oxidize naturally. This piece has been treated with sawdust and urine and has a convincing enough coating to fool even several archaeologists who were presented this piece without knowing its true origin. I'd like to then briefly discuss some firsts of lost wax casting from around the world, noting that the lost wax technique has been common on every continent except Australia. The real issue is when. Some of the oldest known examples of the lost wax technique are objects discovered in the cave of the treasure, Nahal Mishmar. This is from South Israel and dates from roughly 4500 to 3500 BC.
my colleague Serial Shalev has done a lot of good work on this horde, including replication experiments. In Mesopotamia, the technique was known from about 3500 to 2750 BC, when the lost wax technique was used for small scale and then larger scale copper and bronze statues. Metal casting by the Indus Valley civilization began around 3500 BC in the Mohenjo-Daro area, which produced one of the earliest known examples of lost wax casting, an Indian bronze figurine named the Dancing Girl. The Egyptians were practicing lost wax casting from the mid-third millennium BC, starting with bracelets and gold jewelry and moving on to larger objects over time. The lost wax technique was also known in the Aegean during the Bronze Age, particularly during the second millennium BC. The casting method of bronze during the Shang and Zhao periods, roughly 1500 to 500 BC, has been commonly assumed. However, recent studies suggest that the casting method used at this time is the piece mold casting method and not the lost wax method. It seems the lost wax technique did not appear in northern China until the 6th century BC, although of course they were casting very complicated bronze objects using other techniques before then. Lost wax casting is known as rogata in Japanese and dates back to the Yayoi period in about 200 BC. Cast bronzes are known to have been produced in Africa by the 9th century AD in Nigeria and the 15th century AD in the Kingdom of Benin. The lost wax casting tradition was developed by the peoples of South America as well, particularly for gold. The indirect method of lost wax casting is an early anticipation of mass production and permitted the distribution of sculpture to a much larger audience than ever before. And like the printed book from movable type, it helped to spread sculpture throughout the ancient world. However, as I hope this lecture shows, the technique is far from dead even now. Thank you very much.